Welcome to Thursday Night Bible Study at Grace United Church of Christ. Tonight we wrap up our Lenten Bible Study on He Chose the Nails. We'll be looking at Session 5 tonight, and for those of you who have your books, it starts on page 101 if you wish to follow along. We have two objectives for tonight. The first is to explore the implication of Christ's victory over death, as the title of this lesson is, He Chose to Give Us Victory. And as usual, we are going to apply the principles of Lent to our daily lives. Let us pray. Gracious God, we just thank you for this opportunity to come together to study your word. We thank you for walking with us through the five weeks of this Lenten season. We thank you for opening our minds, O oh God, for lifting our spirits and for helping us to cleanse ourselves in so many different ways so that we can draw closer to you. We ask that you open our minds this evening, be present in our Bible studies, so that we might discern your truth in this lesson. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So tonight, um, I want to start by asking, as I always ask, and uh, has anyone had a chance to do the Lenten practice from last week? Is the answer no? <laughs> If the answer is no, we'll proceed. We'll go on. Starting on page 101, uh, I'm going to ask Jim to uh, get books for someone to get books for our uh, guests that just came in. Reverend Mel will get them. <coughs> Welcome. Hi, they're out and about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hi, y'all. We're doing good. We're doing good. Could you hand me that uh, sheet right there? And we'll pass it over. Very good. Thank you. So we're going to uh, begin this session by looking at our video clip. And I'm going to start that right now. And as we do the video, there's a place in your book where you can uh, take notes on what you hear because we're going to discuss reactions to the video when we finish. So. The old man opened the cellar door and shone his light into the back recesses of the space, past the stacks of old newspapers and magazines, past the broken lamp he never fixed, past the boxes of old bills and the broken window frames that needed new glass. Finally, his light came to rest on an old battered case. Reluctantly, he grabbed the handle, pulling it and years of dust off the shelf. He closed the cellar door and set the case on his workbench. He didn't want to open it. But in a few days, his granddaughter would be getting married and she had made a special request. And who is he to refuse his granddaughter on her wedding day? He clicked open the latches and a dull, beat-up trumpet lay staring lifelessly back at him. The last time he had played it was at his son's funeral. He had died at age 21 on the battlefield, leaving behind a young wife and a six-month-old baby. That day, as he had finished the last mournful notes of taps and pulled the trumpet away from his lips, he vowed he would never breathe life back into that trumpet again. But now that baby girl was getting married, 
and he would not break his promise. The old instrument was in no shape to play anything, let alone Mendelssohn's wedding march. A visit to the repair shop would be the first order of business. It looked like summoning up the courage to actually play would have to wait a few days. The old man opened the door to the repair shop and set the old trumpet on the table before the repair man. He half hoped he would hear that it was not repairable. But instead he was told, ah, I've seen worse. Give me a few days to bring it back to life. As soon as the door closed, the repairman slowly picked up the instrument. He had seen this model before, but it had been many years ago when he worked as an apprentice at the company that made the trumpet. He knew it had been made to play beautiful music, but neglect, anger, frustration, any number of other things had gotten in the way. It had been abandoned for other pursuits. The repairman began his work. First, he took the trumpet apart and cleaned every piece. Next, he smoothed out all the dents and patched the holes. The trumpet was at home in his hands. He was, after all, the master craftsman. He was the one who knew the inner workings of this instrument more intimately than anyone else. Slowly, the trumpet began to take proper shape. When all the individual parts were working to his satisfaction, the craftsman carefully put the instrument back together again. Then he buffed it to make it shine. After three days, he was ready for the man to pick it up. And when the old man opened the case, he couldn't believe his eyes. It looked like a brand new instrument. A weight began to lift from his heart. The last song of this trumpet did not have to be taps. The tragedy of his son's passing had turned into the joy of his granddaughter's wedding. On this day, a new song would play, a song of celebration. That afternoon, in a small chapel filled with family and friends, the old man raised the horn to his lips, pointed it skyward, and joyfully played the opening notes of the wedding march. Same instrument, same musician, different tune. The decisions we all face in our lives are like the notes on the page. Our instrument can be used to bemoan tragedy or sing praise and triumph, love and kindness or anger and hate, faith and obedience or doubt and pride. How we play our song is our choice, but a decision must be made. So what tune are you going to play? Have you ever tried to spice up a family dinner with the question, what song would you like to have played at your funeral? Or how about, what are you planning to wear in your casket? Sound like cheery topics? Hardly. Make a list of depressing subjects, and funeral preparations fall somewhere between IRS audits and long-term dental care. Most folks don't like to think about their funeral, much less discuss it. After all, death signals the end of their time on earth, a time of grief and sadness for those they have left behind. This was certainly the case at first for the disciples of Jesus. When Christ was executed on the cross by the Roman soldiers, it must have seemed to them as if everything they had hoped for in the promised Messiah was coming to an end. Could there have been a greater tragedy for them than a dead Jesus? Three years earlier, they had turned their backs on their careers and cast their lot with this Nazarene carpenter. Earlier in the week, they had enjoyed a, a ticker tape parade as Jesus entered Jerusalem. But how quickly things had turned. The people who had called him king on Sunday called for his death the following Friday. Now their friend and their future were sealed behind a rock. The disciple John was the only one present at the cross. And from the cross, Jesus entrusted the care of his mother to this disciple whom he loved. He had seen Christ nailed to the cross. He had witnessed the puzzling midday darkness that fell. Like water douses a fire, the shadows had doused the ridicule. No more taunts, no more jokes, no more mockers. One by one, the onlookers had turned and moved away. 
The trio of dying men had groaned as they hung on the crosses, hoarse, guttural, thirsty groans. They groaned with each rolling of the head and each pivot of the legs. But as the minutes became hours, the groans diminished. And then, John tells us, that just before Jesus died, he asked for something to drink. To find the last time moisture touched his lips, we need to rewind a dozen hours to the meal in the upper room. Since tasting that cup of wine on the night he was betrayed, Jesus had been beaten, spat upon, bruised, and cut. He had been a cross carrier and a sin bearer, and no liquid had salved his throat. He was thirsty. Jesus didn't have to suffer thirst, at least not to the level he did. Six hours earlier, before the nail was pounded, he had been offered drink. Mark said it was wine mixed with myrrh. Matthew described it as wine mixed with gall. Both myrrh and gall contain sedative properties that numb the senses, but Jesus refused them. He refused to be stupefied by the drugs, opting instead to feel the full force of his suffering. Why? Why did he choose to endure all these feelings? Because he knew we would feel them too. He knew we would be weary, disturbed, and angry. He knew we would be sleepy, grief-stricken, and hungry. He knew we'd face pain, if not the pain of the body, the pain of the soul, pain too sharp for any drug. He knew we'd face thirst, if not a thirst for water, at least a thirst for truth. And the truth we glean from the image of a thirsty Christ is he understands. And because he understands, we can come to him. John tells us that after the drink was offered and the afternoon dawn broke, Jesus spoke a final time. It is finished, he said. And with his head bowed, he gave his final breath. John had no way of knowing on that Friday what you and I now know. He didn't know Friday's tragedy would be Sunday's triumph. He would later confess that he did not yet understand from the scriptures that Jesus must rise from the dead. That's why what John did on Saturday is so important. We don't know anything about that day. It's not covered in any of the Gospels. All we know for sure is is that when Sunday came, John was still present. We know this because when Mary Magdalene came looking for him, she found him. Why hadn't he left? You'd think he would have. Who was to say the men who crucified Christ wouldn't come after him? The crowds were pleased with one crucifixion. The religious leaders might have called for more. Why didn't John get out of town? Perhaps it was because he was taking care of Jesus' mother. Or perhaps he didn't have anywhere else to go. It could be he didn't have any money or energy or direction. Or maybe he lingered because he loved Jesus. To others, Jesus was a miracle worker or a master teacher or the hope of Israel. But to John, he was all of these and more. To John... Jesus was a friend. You don't abandon a friend. Not even when that friend is dead. So John chose to linger. And because he lingered on Saturday, he was around on Sunday to see the miracle. Very early on Sunday morning, Peter and John were given the news. Jesus' body is missing. Mary was urgent, both with her announcement and her opinion. She thought Jesus' enemies had taken his body away. Instantly, the two disciples hurried to the tomb. John outran Peter and arrived there first. What he saw so stunned him, he froze at the entrance. What did he see? Strips of linen cloth. The cloth that had been around Jesus' head was now folded up and laid in a different place from the strips of linen. These burial wraps had not been ripped off and thrown down. They were still in their original state. The linens were undisturbed. The grave clothes were still rolled and folded. Through the rags of death, 
John saw the power of life. God had taken the wrappings of death and made them a picture of life. Could he do something similar in our lives? Could he take what today is a token of tragedy, like a beat-up old trumpet, and turn it into a symbol of triumph? We all face tragedy. What's more, we have all received the symbols of tragedy. Yours might be a telegram from the War Department, an ID bracelet from the hospital, a scar or a court subpoena. We don't like these symbols, nor do we want these symbols like wrecked cars in a junkyard. They clutter up our hearts with memories of bad days. But could God use such things for something good? How far can we go with verses like Romans 8, 28? In everything, God works for the good of those who love him. Does everything include tumors and tests and tempers and terminations? John would answer yes. John would tell you God can turn any tragedy into a triumph. If only you wait and watch. You and I would have scripted the story of God's redemption differently. We prefer the Hollywood version. White horses, flashing swords, evil flat on his back. God on his throne. But a split-lipped, puffy-eyed, blood-masked God on a cross. Sponge thrust in his face. Spear plunged in his side. Dice tossed at his feet. No. We wouldn't have written the drama of redemption this way. But then again, we weren't asked to do so. These players and props were heaven-picked and God-ordained. We were not asked to design the hour, but we have been asked to respond to it. In order for the cross of Christ to be the cross of our lives, we need to bring something to the hill. We have seen what Jesus brought. With scarred hands, he offered forgiveness. Through torn skin, he promised acceptance. He took the path to take us home. He wore our garment to give us his own. Now we ask, what will we bring? Maybe we can start with our bad moments. And while we are there, we can give God our mad moments and our bad habits and our selfish moods, our white lies, our binges, and our bigotries. God wants them all, every flop, every failure. He not only wants the mistakes we've made, He wants the ones we are making. Are you making some? If so, don't pretend nothing is wrong. Don't pretend you don't fall. Don't try to get back in the game. Go first to God. The first step after a stumble must be in the direction of the cross. As John wrote, if we confess our sins to God, He can always be trusted to forgive us and take our sins away. He wants our worries as well. When we're worried about our health, or house, or finances, or flights, we can take a mental trip up the hill of Calvary and look again at the pieces of passion. The blood Jesus bled for us, the spear he took for us, the nails he felt for us, the sign he left for us, he did all of this for us. Knowing this, knowing all he did for us there, doesn't it make sense that he will look out for us here? And what about our fears about our final moments? Barring the return of Christ first, you and I will have one on this earth in a split second. We'll leave what we know and enter what we don't. That's what bothers us. Death is the great unknown. We're always a bit skittish about the unknown. God promises to come at an unexpected hour. Paul tells us that when that day comes, it will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever, and we who are living will also be transformed. On that day, God will take us from the gray world we know to a golden world we don't. But since we don't, we aren't sure we want to go. We even get upset at the thought of His coming. 
For that reason, God wants us to trust him. Don't let your hearts be troubled, he urges us. I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may be where I am. As we close this study, I want you to do a simple exercise. Think for a moment again about Paul's words in Romans 8, 28. In everything, God works for the good of those who love him. Remove the word everything and replace it with the symbol of your tragedy. How would this verse read in your life? In hospital stays, God works for the good. In divorce papers, God works for the good. In a prison term, God works for the good. If God can change the disciples' lives through a tragedy such as the cross and the tomb, could it be he will use a tragedy to change yours? As hard as it may be to believe, you could be only a Saturday away from a resurrection. Because he presents things in a way that no one else has. Someone was talking about this this whole uh, notion of a crown of thorns when he first introduced that idea, and it made us stop and think about it. Hmm, that's a gift. Any other reactions to this to this video? I guess so. Um, that's start with the last thing that he said, as hard as it may be to believe, you could be only a Saturday away from a resurrection. That's something. Mm -hmm. That's that's something. Um, And then he said, uh, the first step after a stumble must be in the direction of the cross. Mm -hmm. I didn't say that like that this week, but I sure said it. Mm -hmm. The first step after a stumble must be in the direction of of the cross. And then um, he opened up talking about funeral preparations. And I know for a lot of people that seems morbid Mm -hmm. to plan your your home going service, but we're going. We are going. And for me, it helps families, they're already struggling enough. And if you've got all of the work done pretty much, you know, where is it go, where it's gonna be and uh, what songs you want sung and you know, um, whatever particulars that you could provide for your family, it just makes it so much easier so that they can enjoy your passage to, to be with the Lord, you know, and, and grieve the way that uh, they need to. I think a lot of families don't want to have that conversation because, first of all, they're afraid of death, and second of all, they're in denial about their own mortality. Mm-hmm. Just like you said, we're afraid of the unknown, mm-hmm. but we have to trust Him because He said, "Don't be afraid. Yeah. I will be there." So it, it, it is scary. I mean, to say that you're not, and, and you're, you're afraid of the unknown. Yeah, that is also true. But well, one day we all got to go. You know, you know got to do that. Even when my mother left me, you know, people would say, oh, girl, you should be thankful because your mom lived, yeah, she was 92 years old. But mm-hmm. nobody wants to see their parents. I don't care about their mom. You know, nobody wants to see them. You know? But that's a lot that, like I said, we have to accept them. We all have to go through it. Mm-hmm. Well, we Anyone else? 
had one more comment I wanted to ask. Um, I hear a lot of preachers be saying that, uh, actually, we spoke to celebrate Saturdays instead of Sunday. So these roles on Saturday, I don't know if I just said that. But I was taught that Sunday is Sunday. The seventh day is Sunday, not the Saturday is not the seventh day. I think that's more a uh, tradition mm -hmm. than anything else. Back in the days when, uh, right after Jesus was crucified, you had people trying to sort out what mm -hmm. all of this meant. And so they would pull together the uh, religious scholars and uh, people from all over and debate about these things. And it was decided pretty much by committee mm -hmm when these things would be celebrated, when these things would be recognized. Uh, the important thing is that our Lord was crucified and he was resurrected. Mm -hmm. And the dates that we placed on those occurrences are more or less something that we decided. But also, <clears throat> with Jesus being Jewish, the Sabbath was on a Saturday. And so we're Christians. And so, as, as uh, Reverend Lori said, um, the day for Christians, the beginning of the week is Sunday. Yeah, so that's why we say that it happened on Sunday. But uh, for Jewish people, the Sabbath is the Saturday. Um, seventh day Adventists think Saturday is their day of worship yes, you know, as is. well. Yes, so, it is. You know, there's some. Some people believe in Christ, but they celebrate uh, on, uh, on Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> do you believe that uh, when Jesus left the disciples, do you believe the disciples were really were lost? Were they wandering, you know, in the world? What do you think? What What do you believe? Sister I, I believe they were lost in a lot of ways. You know. Some people, like some of the disciples might have believed what Jesus was saying and some really didn't understand what he was saying. Mm -hmm. So, I think, I may be wrong, but I believe some of them were. I believe that some of them were lost physically as well as in other ways. The disciples had a track record of being confused, not really knowing what Jesus meant when he talked. And if you think about it, Jesus' uh, ascension into heaven, uh, the scripture says that even as he was ascending, some doubted. Mm -hmm. And so there's always this, this doubt among the disciples and among people today. I think. <coughs> and yeah, they were with Jesus. They walked with Jesus. Mm -hmm. They saw all of these fantastic and miraculous things that Jesus did. And everybody doesn't get it at the same time, even now. Everybody doesn't get it at the same time, and they can see uh, things happen, things they didn't think could happen, and they can see those things happen. And still there's a part of them that has doubt, maybe not about that, but the next thing that comes up. We often forget, you know, the things that, that have, been, uh, have been done in our lives. The last time Jesus healed us. We get sick again and we think, oh, Lord, I ain't going to make it. <laughs> but he healed you the last time, right? Yeah, right. You know? <coughs> That's a good question. That is a very good question and one that I don't have a specific answer to. Um, what makes you think that? Because some people think that Jesus said that God eats and all of his stuff.
They giving out dancing, they taking out music, they taking out everything they can to keep the children disillusioned. Just one time they performed the song of Jesus Christ on March the 24th. I mean, March the 14th, and it was like doing this. Superstar? We caught it. The walkout. The walkout. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This is just one time, but they never did before. Wow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Jesus Christ is something that we don't understand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I noticed that the things that she did well too, that we should have more religious, you know, plans and other stuff. Well, they certainly have managed to uh, separate religion mm-hmm. from what goes on in the schools. But there are some uh, some people, <coughs> like our pastor sitting next to me, who was a principal in Chicago public schools and still managed to have the kids think about things by having this quiet time. I'm, I'm, t- I'm telling on you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and one could look upon that as prayer mm-hmm. and in some way. But there are ways to uh, get the children to focus mm-hmm. on those internal things. One of the things that stuck out for me <clears throat> was this whole idea of the instrument. <coughs> he said at one point that the uh, craftsman took the instrument apart and cleaned every part of it and then he polished it and Mm -hmm. took a a mallet and banged out the the dents in it. And that that was meaningful to me because it's always been one of my desires to be an instrument that God could uh, use in any way that God chose to use it. And then I thought about the little drummer boy all he had was that drum and he played that to the best of his ability and so I think that all of us could look upon ourselves as instruments in that regard. And those things that we uh, that don't need to be there are the banging of the mallet mm-hmm. <laughs> to take out the dents, you mm-hmm. know. Because it hurts when you're going through I think it was something in here that uh, said that on page one oh six that some form of death always precedes new life. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And it's amazing how um, that our faith is always expressed, or most of the time we get more out of it when it's expressed in song. And it's something about the singing Mm -hmm. and and singing your praises and and instruments, and it seems like that's the language to God, if not of God, um, that is most prevalent with people, with humans, talking to them, they don't get it. But if you sing to them and, and something strikes them in their spirit, I mean, you get a reaction with music more so than you can with talking. Sure. Well, I don't. <laughs> Sometimes I do. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think that there's a lot of theology in the sacred music we sing in mm-hmm. church. As a matter of fact, if you listen to the songs in one denomination, it might emphasize a certain thing like justice. But if you listen to songs in another denomination from another culture, you might hear an emphasis on the struggle and the help and intervention we need from from Jesus. Yes, Jim. Well, the thing that I find most interesting about this particular topic is that words and music are pure human constructs. So God already knows what's in our heart. He knows what we're trying to say. We're the ones who don't understand. So we use mu- we use music and words to communicate to ourselves because God already knows. So I think it's important <coughs> to understand that, that, that it's humans talking to humans. You know, and so whatever whatever mechanism we can use to get the word across, that's what we're doing. I agree, and I think that God. <coughs> has blessed some musicians mm-hmm. with the gift of not using a word, but striking those chords oh, that stir yes. our mm-hmm. spirits. And so that's another form of communication. Any other uh, reactions? One thing that uh, 
next and Cato asked us to do is to consider Romans 8.28 in everything God works for the good of those who love him. And he asked us to complete this sentence in blank, God works for the good. I have that on the agenda for a little bit later, but I'd like to move that up now. And in, in what is God working for the good in us right now? And what is God working for the good? Well, I think um, working for the good in, in myself is uh, waking up every morning. Okay. And being able to sit, thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Helena? Yes, what? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mine's is about my sin. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. like, I want to. When we wake up, we just feel so happy, not sad, I know. But we still have an anything we mm -hmm. wake up. Yeah, you still be happy and you still not. It sometimes gets scared, sometimes it's still like dark. Mm -hmm. You know I got no fear in me. Um, we all do. But you know, sometimes I'm like, well, I'm like, he's got to help me. I need some help. I'm scared right now. So like, I really need somewhere I'm scared of, like the kitchen. Anyone else? <coughs> I know I was thinking about my mother <coughs> this today. My mother passed in 2004, and she was a single parent, but every Easter she made it a very special occasion for us. Uh, there was a, a, a discount store back then called Bell Scott. I don't know if anybody remembers the Bell Scott discount stores, but it was uh, on the same level as Kmart and some of those. But uh, she was a secretary, and she would use her salary to buy all five of her children new clothes for Easter because it was such a special occasion. Um, Easter was uh, a, a joyous occasion in our household, and not only did we have the new clothes, but we had the meal. So in her tribulations, in her poverty, in her overwork, in her stress, everything worked for the good because she was laying the foundation for us in terms of faith, in terms of how we viewed Easter. And uh, I can look at her picture right now and, and smile because of all of that she instilled in us. So even in, even in her struggles, mm -hmm. that worked for the good of all of us. Yeah, my, my, my good friends don't like that. We are on her funeral day. I didn't know what song she was singing. I was too scared. That's what I love. And I really want to say it, but I didn't write down the so, so later, I went up the stage and said, it was too sad. Mm -hmm. It made me cry. And then, so later, she said, um, mm -hmm. that to not be scared of nothing, mm -hmm. just how your best to do everything you can do, God did, but still happy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So your fears turned out to generate some happy thoughts for you in the end. So it all worked out in the end, and I think that's the message we're talking about here. Let's move, let's move on. <clears throat> we're going to uh, look at item two here, beginning on page 105. Uh, Juanita, could I get you to read uh, that text, please, down to the first page. Okay. Receiving the, the gift of victory. 
The victory accomplished through Christ's death and resurrection is sometimes referred to as the Paschal Mystery. The word Paschal comes from the Greek word for Passover, the Jewish remembrance of when the angel of death passed over the Hebrew families prior to their exodus from slavery in Egypt. See Exodus 12, 13, 23. The lamb sacrificed and eaten at Jewish Passover celebrations was the Paschal lamb, a new term, a term New Testament writers also use for Christ. The Paschal mystery encompasses God's hidden plan of salvation revealed in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. In his first letter to the church at, at Corinth, the Apostle Paul summarizes the events of the Paschal mystery when he writes, Christ died for our sins, just as the, the scriptures say. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures say. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4. The Paschal mystery is also understood as the recurring pattern of God's transforming work in our lives, that some form of death always precedes new life, and that death never has the last word. Speaking of the life that would follow his own death, Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Okay, any reactions to what Juanita just read? God mm -hmm. is the Passover. It, it let us know that Christ died for our sins. I didn't talk about the tadpoles. I decided to focus on the butterflies instead. And I read 102, mm -hmm. and I got a good understanding of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My so, also read it. what we see here is a pattern, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, as I pointed out this past Sunday, and as we've seen over and over again, God designed the universe in such a way that it starts with life and then there has to be death and burial and resurrection and constantly is changing and that kind of uh, goes on for generations and generations and I know Juanita at least has noted me saying from everlasting to everlasting that's one of my favorite phrases but it goes on forever without end because of this pattern of life death burial and resurrection uh, oh, they also say that energy is never lost in the universe. It's never lost. So the the life that you've had, it goes off into the universe. It never ceases. So, you know, before my sister died, he gave her a 75th birthday party. Everybody showed up on my mother's side of the family. She sat there and they let the balloons go. Her balloon just traveled up in the sky. It never came back. We never saw it set. Mm. And this year she died. Mm. So let's let's look at this first bullet point here. <coughs> For a seed, there is life on both sides of death, planted. But each life is of a different kind. What three words or phrases would you use to describe the life of the seed before death? 
what three words or phrases would you use to describe the life that follows death? Eternal life. Okay, so you're saying eternal life is something you would use to describe the life that follows death? Okay. That's okay. what we should be striving for. Others? Jim? I have an analogy of water. Okay. Water in, in a constant state is liquid. But then when you stress water and you heat it up, it transforms. It turns to steam. You know, that steam does not come back to water under mm. most circumstances. You know, it gets evaporated into the atmosphere and it transforms into a different because one of the fundamental laws of physics is that energy transforms. You know, as you indicated, transforms them and goes to another entity or transforms something else. Mm -hmm. It's still out there, but it's in a different form. It has transformed. And the same is true of water. Okay. That's a good analogy. Yeah, and I like that analogy, Jim, because they, they say that of water as well, is that the water that is on Earth today is the same water that's been here since the beginning of its time. It, it evapor I mean, it's here, it evaporates, and then it comes back down as rain again, so it, it does not leave well, here. we assume we that assume particular drop comes back down, but we really don't know. Don't know. It could be a different drop. So that's the same. That's the same way our body is going to be getting it. Mm -hmm. It transfer over into a new body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what about the seed before death? Uh, <laughs> word I'm thinking about is uh, potential as a seed before death. Um, also a seed before death could be, uh, well, potential. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to use potential. Let somebody else come up with other words about a seed before death. That's a good analogy, too. Because the roots from the seed go down into the ground. You know that? Most seeds, the roots go down. And if they proliferate, that means they spread out into the ground itself, but they're still in the ground. But then all of a sudden, on the other side, you get a sprout that goes up into the air, you know, and it looks completely different. It experiences things completely different. It has air and photosynthesis and all those things. Yeah. Okay. So I want to ask him a question. <laughs> yeah. So the seed, does the seed ever die? What if you never put it in the soil? What happens to that seed? Does the seed never die? Does the seed ever die? Well, most living things have a life cycle. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, so I was going to say is that you can go to the store and buy grass seed. You don't know how long it's set on the shelf. But then look what the scripture says. Okay. <clears throat> I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil mm -hmm. and dies, it remains He's alone. alone. That's okay. just the seed. There's no roots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, it has to have some kind of germination process yes. in order for it to live within that particular culture. Mm -hmm. Okay. But then there's another there's another thing, it has to die into itself to blossom and grow into a different culture, which is the air, right? <laughs> I mean okay. the analogy still holds. <coughs> yeah. All right, let's move on. Overall. So we do. We yeah, have to be. We yeah. have to be. Yes, we do. We've got to be pointed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, would you like to? Okay, so you're looking at... Um, okay, go on and read that. You recognize the tree, right? On either side of the foresee and the before and after the life periods begin experiencing Whenever we contain some form of depth of a trace, tragedy. Tragedy. Mm -hmm. That's okay. That's okay. Go on, babe. A person struggle and choice to deny ourselves. 
That means and other things, etc. Yep. Okay. And then when my the same two sets of words and phrases you use for seeds also apply to the human experience on either side of the of the hill. Okay. No, you did a good job of reading. Um, Jim and I recently celebrated uh, another anniversary. What anniversary? So when it started out. It was just Jim, you know? mm-hmm. and um, he wanted me to select a picture to uh, use to post on Facebook. Well, I decided to use a picture that depicted our family, all of those things that have grown mm-hmm. out of that relationship. Mm-hmm. And Jim and I realized that we won't be here forever. But as that family proliferates, it's going to oh, go yeah. on. Mm-hmm. And that's the word she and I understand. Proliferates. As, as that uh, relationship goes on mm-hmm. spreads out. and spreads out, then uh, we will have eternal life until Jesus comes mm-hmm. back because, because the seeds that we planted will live forever through our children and our grandchildren and our great grandchildren, etc. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's let's move on. Uh, would someone read number three, please? Yes, ma'am. Oh, number three. Number three. Mm-hmm. Author and pastor Eugene Peterson comments on God's Paschal work in our lives when he writes, "All suffering, all pain." All emptiness, all disappointment is seed. Sow it in God, and he will finally bring a crop of joy from it. Mm -hmm. If we think of the hardships and losses of this life as seeds, we have at least three options for what we can do with them. One, we can cling to our seeds and refuse to sow them. Two, We can sow our seeds in God, or three, we can sow our seeds in something other than God. In practical terms, how would you describe what it means to follow through on each option? Any thoughts on that? Well, certainly, number one, we cling Mm -hmm. to those seeds of suffering, pain, emptiness, disappointment, things that didn't happen, things we want it to happen, that stuff comes out in other ways, and usually it, 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 it's offensive and, uh, to other people, and it's hurtful to other people because basically you have not dealt with that stuff. You're holding on to it. You won't let it go. Um, when we sow our seeds in God, we acknowledge that those things have happened to us but that they're bigger than us, and I can't do anything with it, Jesus, so you take this. Mm-hmm. I would have been a Beyonce. You would have been what? A Beyonce. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I could sing, I could dance. Mm-hmm. I wore clothes that were not appearing to most people. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. I wanted my kids to be mine. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. And then the third one, we can sow our seeds in something other than God. I remember um, when my husband died, and I was um, I was very angry uh, with God, and so I was holding on to anger. Um, I didn't understand, you know. I mean, these are thoughts that I was having. What kind of God would do this? You know, I've been married, I've been divorced, and now I've married again, and this man is wonderful, mm-hmm. and now he's gone. What, what kind of God does that? And <clears throat> but one one night. While I was in my bed and I was uh, crying and, and crying out, it occurred to me that I had a choice. My choice was to either give that to God or allow other things to happen as a result of that. I had a choice. Mm-hmm. And my choice was that I was going to give it to God and not something other than God. So, so the devil was glad. 
Well, the devil was probably mad. Was glad until you changed your mind. There you go. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Right. Right. Or you could have done number one. You could have gone to it. Exactly. And just grieve eternally. You know? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And at some point, you have to let it go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Uh, let's move on. We uh, we always run short of time. Sister uh, Ragsdale, could I get you to read uh, the first part? Of, oh, okay. That, that's okay. I'll read it. Speaking of Jesus' empty grave clothes, and I'm on page 108, mm -hmm. Max said, God took a token of tragedy and turned it into a symbol of triumph. We all face tragedy and hardships, but the promise of scripture is that God is always at work to bring victory and new life, even from the rags of death. The Apostle Paul writes, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. From Romans 8, 28, 35, and 37. The phrase translated overwhelming victory is a compound of two Greek words, hyper and nikio. Nikio means to be victorious, and hyper is an intensifier of whatever it precedes. Overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. You may be familiar with the Greek word nike, the noun form of nikio, which means victory. The Apostle John uses both words when he writes, everyone who is a child of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Um, having said that, I want us to turn to uh, page 110. <clears throat> In, yes, one I, I, I like that, that second bullet point there, trusting that God is always at work for okay, our good. Okay, would you read that for us, okay. please? I'm sorry. No uh, trusting that God is always at work for our good does not mean pretending we don't feel the pain of loss or that everything in life is beautiful when it's not. Jesus never flinched from acknowledging the reality of suffering. Instead, he gave us reason to hope and an even deeper reality we get a glimpse of both reality and deeper reality in the words Jesus spoke to his disciples after preparing them for his own impending death. I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you may have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Amen. Amen. I, I had to. Yeah, yeah that's good. That that's that a powerful good. one. Yeah. <laughs> so if living in victory is possible, even in the midst of many trials and sorrows, mm -hmm. how would you describe what that victory is? And I would say that uh, the victory is that I have a faith and assurance, a belief, that this is not it for me. There's something beyond this that Christ has prepared for me. Um, would anyone else like to comment on that? Because we are going to have to wrap up, as Jim is saying, so I'm going to hold comments. Um, to those listening to us uh, on the internet, and we have to wrap up again. <laughs> but thank you for joining us, not only for this session, but for those of you who were with us through the previous four sessions, we thank you for your participation and your support of this internet ministry. For those of you who uh, don't have a church home or who have not yet accepted Christ into your life, we ask you to consider Christ and the victory that he has brought to us through his sacrifice. We invite you to worship with us at Grace United Church of Christ. We're located at 2500 223rd Street in Sauk Village. 
We have Sunday school beginning at 9.30 for both adults and children. Our main worship service is at 11 o'clock, and we would love to have you come and fellowship with us. Until we meet again, may God bless you richly.